uh, what we saw in the last class was uh, where actually the main characteristics of, uh, of uh, the terrain in, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, geometrical differentials, meaning the slope and the curvatures. I also mentioned that uh, uh, slopes and curvature allows you to do a lot of things. And I tried to just on the map of uh, slopes and curvatures show how you can infer some processes that are acting on the landscape. And on the basis of what we did yesterday, actually we are able to do even more. And this was uh, what we start to, uh, to see now. OK. The title uh, strangely remains in Italian, but sometimes uh, it is the delineation of uh, uh, catchments, more or less. Derived quantities, mixed with English and in Italian. And uh, we start from what we learned yesterday, and uh, we go ahead. Uh, the main derived quantities are essentially two. The, 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 uh, the drainage directions and the contributing areas that are derived from the drainage directions. Uh, I already mentioned that you have a slope and um, if you have some ball that on, on top of a mountain, the ball will go uh, according to the, the, the steepest descent, meaning uh, along the slopes, along the gradients of it. Uh, this, is a not, this is not exactly true for, for a ball because uh, when you start from zero velocity, then the balls acquire some some velocity, so it has kinetic energy. And uh, when the, the gradient deviates, the balls continues for the law of mechanics and doesn't go directly to the, to, to the steepest descent. And the same is true for water or any fluid. So water is going to the grad, uh, is following the gradients. There are inertial effects, but we neglect the inertial effects. So drainage directions that are derived from the slopes uh, represent more or less the flow of water when all the kinetic energy is more or less dissipated. The other concept, uh, drainage areas, is that when you sit, uh, you are parachute, parachuted in, in a place uh, on a mountain, and you have a catchment on your on your shoulders, and we we'll see how to estimate these uh, contributing areas. Uh, the concept of uh, drainage directions, uh, uh, I, I have just explained it. It goes to the gradients, but unfortunately, uh, we saw yesterday that, that our landscape is not a continuum. At least we didn't uh, choose to, to treat it as a continuum. We have, we have a surface which is a discretizing point. So whenever we, uh, we have this, this type of landscape, the situation we have in front is uh, we have a discrete number of places where we can go because if we tile all the landscape, we can go not point by point, but from a point to the next tile. Here you see some uh, um, typical uh, configuration. You, if you have uh, triangles, like here, from a point you can go in six directions. So you can actually go in any of the degree. Even if the real steepest descent of the landscape is in this direction here, you, you have the other point, you have data only on a few directions. 
This is, is a, a triangular type of, of uh, discretization of the terrain. And you have six directions where to go. When you have a triangular type of discretization, which is the most common uh, type of, da of, of data we have on the terrain, we have four directions. So four directions uh, um, was thought to be too limited at the beginning. When, and they say, why we can't go also in the direction uh, that are 45 degrees, not just on the four main directions. So we call, here we have a topology with six directions, four directions, and eight directions. This is usually called in literature D8. So whenever we have the landscape, we have it discretized, and we, we have to, cho to choose which type of discretization we cope with. And uh, we usually cope with the last one, which is we have eight directions where to go when we are sitting in the point. This brings into in the description of the landscape uh, several limitations, and that we are talking about of them is now. The first limitation is uh, in the D8 uh, scheme is that uh, maybe the landscape is, or is not just oriented as a plane along the X or the Y axis, the E or the J, but is uh, oriented in a, let's say this is 20, 22 degrees, just in the middle. So. The real steepest descent that you, uh, that you estimate is going in the red direction, but we can go just on towards two or toward or towards the three, the point three. Now assume you have a long plane. Uh, you are seated over there. You go. You say, okay, I cannot decide here. I go on direction two. Then I go again on direction two. Then I go again on direction two. So assume now that you are in the middle of Asia. You have a mountain in the middle of Asia. You are going, and there is a big plane, hundreds of kilometers. And you, the, the real water goes along the red line, but you, with the A direction, are systematically adding an error and go in, instead of going into the Pacific Ocean, you go into the Indian Ocean. So uh, this, this is the first error that discretization brings along. You, have, you can have in some places a systematic error of uh, identification of, of the gradient. Uh, a way to work around it is to just Taking, taking into account which is the angular deviation you accumulate in each, in, each, in, in each step. Here, for instance, we have two types of angular direction that are of a, a deviation. One is the linear deviation called delta 1 or delta 2 according to, the, 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 uh, to which, which is the, the initial system of reference. It is, uh, sign in small green there and uh, or an angular direction and you say if you do that like we, we were doing before we go always taking the two the direction two we are accumulating an error an angular error or a deviation and we can decide that when this deviation is too much we choose the other we choose not to go in direction two, but we go in direction three. This allows to correct to correct the, 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 the error due to, due to the discretization. This is actually the main type of error that we do when we discretize our landscape with tiles.
In any case, in this way, we, you can map the directions of the of the flow uh, with a with the trick that I saw I told you yesterday. We have sometimes you have bumps and holes in the landscape to identify drainage direction if it goes around the, the gradients. We have we have to fill the holes, so we have to use a, a some program we our is called pit filler and you will use later that fill the direction and here you see the whole the whole direction of the hydro shed um, schema of, uh, of all Europe and the part of the Asia also Iran is here so you are represented <laughs> in the and you see the, 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 the drainage direction are pretty random around all the, di the directions. Uh, from a smaller area, uh, the, the painting of the uh, direction, we have eight directions, say, so the number are goes from one to eight, and the color correspond to one of the eight numbers. In a, in a smaller landscape, uh, the the picture is not appears not so random like here. There are uh, directions that are connected to the position of, of uh, the main mountains. If we divide the mountain belts, if, yes. If we divide the model for even smaller so not only a direction and then we can, we are uh, do we able to calculate the exact that red direction of water that is reality yeah i mean this is mistake and error so for uh, one way would be to <laughs> interpolate the wall surface with splines for instance so you have actually continuous representation of the surface but uh, you know, historically, uh, the uh, the first guy who did it, who was uh, David Tarbotton, I guess, or Larry Ben, uh, University of Utah, Larry, Larry, uh, David Tarbotton, and Larry Ben, University of Carolina. I don't remember of North Carolina or South Carolina. They did in the night at the beginning of the nineties, the end of the eighties. They decided that interpolating was not a good thing because it was adding a layer of complexity above the data and was better to have this simple representation in, in eight directions and that's all. But obviously you can interpolate the surface with splines uh, so the, the surface become continuous but you have to be aware that you are adding a layer of complexity and also at that time Another aspect that was uh, important, in, 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 in actually still important, is that uh, surface is not so regular. So uh, surfaces uh, were reproduced as, were considered as fractals, meaning discontinuous surfaces. So representing them as flying was kind of losing other part of information. Yeah. So. There is a trade-off and each time you do a choice that you are taking into account and that was historically what it was done. And then it has uh, spread down, spread everywhere. And every, let's say any tools that is a, that exist more or less use this conceptualization. But obviously you can change it. When we have drainage directions identified, we can say, oh, I come in this tide here, I go here, then I move in, in the other directions, and so on. So, and I arrive from the place where I, I am to the, to the sea or to a lake. So that is uh, what is uh, flow directions is about. Uh, you have a tile and the space is divided in tiling. In any place you identify the directions, uh, almost according to the gradient, because you have to choice to go in, in one tile and the other part. 
and you obtain, uh, let's say, those type of representation you have on the um, on the top left. Uh, once you have a representation like this, you can say, okay, uh, if I am seated here, I have other points that flow through me, and I can ca count how many points I have on my shoulders, including the place where I am. So this is the flow accumulation. Here's a start from zero, but uh, uh, I would prefer to start from one actually. Zero, one, uh, one two, uh, you say when you are the starting point, you don't have you have zero area on your shoulder. When you go down, you have one area. When the, you go down here, you see you have seven. Why seven? Because there you have more converging direction that are accumulating areas. And then 20, 24, 35, which is actually what it could be a mainstream of the river the main flowing direction. So you have the total flow accumulation, the flow direction. Uh, uh, we call the total flow accumulation total, cont uh, total contributing areas. Contributing area is a some, sometimes a, 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 a naming that can be, should be understood at least. Because uh, contributing area means that, that the whole area you have upstream. If you give it a hydrological meaning, this could be not correct. Because even if you have a, a, a certain amount of area, for instance, 20 pixels above your shoulder, it doesn't mean that the water you are, uh, that arrived there is from the whole area. Because of the conformation of the surface, maybe some of the water is trapped somewhere. So in any uh, instant of time, the, 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 the hydrologically contributing area can be less than 20, okay? But uh, we will use here total contributing area just to say the landscape contributing area, not the hydrologically contributing area. If we represent the flow accumulation in a, in a real catchment, what you obtain is a feature like this one. And one thing, you say here we have 51,200 pixels. Uh, here one pixel I, I assume is uh, 10 by 10 meters. And you see that flow accumulation clearly defined some that looks like to our eyes streams. So you say, oh, we have the river network here. And that can be an idea, but when does the river network start? This could be important both for calculating how water moves because water moves differently outside the river network and inside the river network with different velocities. Above the, when the water is in the surface, the, the velocity is of the order of meter per second. When it's below, is the order of centimeters or millimeters per second, depending on where you are. So the, the water is much slower when it is not inside, when it is not on the surface and what is when it is not inside the channel. There are several questions here. There, there is another question actually that I uh, hide from you before. And that is the problem of flow, uh, uh, in the problem of flow accumulation. Now consider the, the slope that you have on the, on the left you have a kind of a, a geomorphological classification of the slope, upper slope, uh, back slope, sho shoulder, foot slope, according to what geomorphologists say about this. this. And this is a pretty planar, linear and planar according to the classification that we did yesterday. So 
flow accumulates more or less linearly going from up to down. Not a problem at all. But when we have a surface which is also a curvature, actually the uh, flow lines converge. The, the, uh, the, the flow accumulates in some places. So you have here this uh, more more water in some places than the other. Here, everything is uniform. Here, you have accumulation of water actually on the center. From a, a general point of view, uh, the water moves the sediment and the, sedi the conformation of the terrain, which is made of sediment and, and bedrock. Uh, constrain the movement of water. So the problem is a big carbon problem, this one, to, to be solved. In reality, what happens is that we have water that moves, the landscape is formed by water, and the water is concentrated by landscape. It's a non-linear process. We don't, uh, in, in, uh, in an absolute sense, we cannot separate the two moments, the two things, but is what hydrology do every day. For many applications, and for the application we use in, in this course, we will assume that the, the, the landscape is kind of fixed. Maybe I will do some consideration at the end. But the landscape obviously is not fixed. It depends on time scales. It depends on what you are describing. If you are describing here uh, the formation of uh, of a flood, in, during the formation of a uh, fluvial flood, I don't know how to say, uh, certainly you have movement of sediment, but you can consider at least a certain scale that the, the landscape is not changing. But then you have a lot of exceptions. When you have the very flow, for instance, landscape is abruptly changing with the movement of water. So, what I am saying uh, is a, a, slip, a slippery condition. It's not absolute. The, a, a more realistic landscape is like this one you see. Oh, oh, oh. So you see that uh, here you have a various a landscape with various uh, curvatures and um, the, the landscape is very complex and uh, so curvatures are also indicated and here maybe you have convergence of water and so on so one successful representation of the landscape is a, uh, the one called the infinity this was kind of uh, um, implemented by David Arbottom in a famous paper by 1997 and so what he says okay real situation is like this one that you see before here very complex what happens for in, in this case uh, what happens is that water, even if we, we would in principle be able to go in the, along the gradients, we still have a dispersion of water around the gradient because of the microscale of the topography. And, and, and maybe also you have in the dynamic process of uh, distributing water, uh, it, kind of a, a diffusion phenomenon that spread water here and there. So the, uh, the, the infinity thing is a trick where you say when we have this drainage direction here, actually we not accumulate the water along, just along this direction, but we spread a little bit of say water but it's area in reality I spread a little of area uh, on the left and a little of area on the right uh, 
the procedure is codified. We don't, we, we, we don't need to understand that, how actually you spread it. But in reality, the, the thing is that uh, water is much less spread than you believe. So the representation like this one remain still true, even if even if you can adopt a, a thing like this one. This is particularly interesting when you are in a divergent part of the slope. When you have here, for instance, you see here the vector of the flow go diverging. So it actually there they are not accumulating. In the years when this, this theory appeared, uh, one discussion was important discussion, and it is now a, a big discussion. We have an ERC uh, project financed on, on these issues. So where do channels begin? Because of where do channels begin, I've told before, it is important for uh, understanding the formation of the floods, but obviously it is also important for the transport of, uh, it is probably more important for uh, transport of pollutants or sediment or traces. So if the water is dispersing here, it's not accumulating enough power to erode the, set, erode the, the surface and excavate and create a channel. So here we are in a hill zone. Here is accumulating and uh, accumulating water means the ability to erode and then, and, and then uh, start the channel. At the same time, from our point of view of calculation of the what, which area we have on, the, on, the, on our shoulder here, we should see that when we go downstream, the water is not actually accumulating on this side. It's just dispersing. Just disperses like here. So the, this is the infinity is a trial to to uh, cope with this position. But actually, this process is not very important where the water is converted, because when you are in a valley, you know, think simply to a, you you put a, a ball that goes down to a valley. If you are in a convex surface, if you do an error, the ball goes in a direction or goes in the other direction, and the error you do is large. But and when you are in a convergent, a concave uh, things, the ball always finish to go down, down in the valley. So when, when you have a convergent topography, every type of correction is not so important because at the end you go on the valley. It is important when you are on the field zone. So uh, that's for my small contribution to, to this issue. And uh, the other thing is, uh, the, the other thing is that uh, how much is the curvature of the topography? Usually the curvature of the topography is small. So, the natural curvature of topography doesn't tell, doesn't disperse very much, unless you are on the boulder, then, then obviously it's critical. What happens when we have drainage duration and we know and we know how to accumulate our uh, um, area? Uh, we we know where we are. We know where we go we know what we have upstream. Um, all the points that we have upstream are our upslope catchment. That's all. And our goal is uh, actually to identify the catchment. So when we have the tools that I have just illustrated, we are able to identify which is the, at least the surface catchment on our shoulders. Hydrologically, this is, is not uh, really true because the surface, we are staying on the surface, so we are dealing with the topography. 
while a catchment is also subsurface. In some cases, the subsurface uh, topography can be different from the surface topography. So water underground, the catchment underground can be larger or smaller than the surface topography. And the roughness and the, uh, of the underground uh, catchment can be different, actually different. You know, you have a bedrock, then you have a soil. The, the, our catchment in our view is the surface of the soil. And sometimes we have outcrop coming out. In that case, uh, the soil is a zero depth. Below, we have some, uh, uh, some, some bedrock, the pure bedrock, and that is a different type of topography that also is determining how our catchment is working. But that we usually don't know. Bedrock also has curvature? Sorry? Bedrock also has curvature or flat? Yes, uh, well, but no, bedrock is soil. usually more rougher than the surface. When you look at the surface, you have to think that the bedrock be, be below the surface is much more uh, as a, a, its own surface, or su the separation surface is much more rougher, because the process of re re redistribution of soil on the surface are mostly of diffusive type, which means that they are going to create smooth surfaces, while the, the bedrock down there can be much more rougher. Unless you have other things, for instance, when you have a forest, on locally the, the roots of the, of, the big, of the big trees are changing the, lo the local direction of the topography, and that is also create a lot of bumps. But whenever we have the drainage direction, and we sit in a point, for instance here, we are able to get all the directions and delineate the catchment we have on, on, our, on our shoulders. And this is the case to catchment of the uh, Canali and uh, Chismon, which are two here in the, coming down from the Dolomites, beautiful places, 100 kilometers from here. And, uh, and so that is what we have to do actually, we have to accomplish. Here you can, well, once you have extracted a thing like this, uh, you can also project on, on an object like a virtual globe, like a NASA Worldwind or a, a Google Earth, and having a visualization like this one. Still, there is a step that we did not accomplish, which is fixing this this point, the head, the, the head water where they are. There is another function that we can estimate on the basis of our topography, because we have the drainage direction, we can say, okay, I am sitting in this point, going to the outlet of the uh, of the basin which path do we have to follow, and which is the length that brings me to the outlet. Here you see in shadows that you have different colors, meaning that, for instance, the same distance from the outlet is around here. It's not some circular thing, it's uh, roughly going, because it's following the drainage direction they are we saw they have a, at least a sort of a random component. So for instance, you can have a place, two places here where the distance from the outlet is very much different. Because two places here at, at, at crossing the divide do a different path, which is longer. But this path depicted here is the path that water does. So in a sense, this is a, a picture that can tell you something about the ideological response of the river. This function here is called width function. And uh, 
our our estimation will be d to to all distance to outlet, and we can estimate the distance to outlet. There is a disclaimer that I have to do with Tom. All these quantities that we are calculating, like the distance to outlet, is not actually in 3D. It's uh, the, the projection of it. This is an inheritance from the, 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 the day we did this stuff with the maps. We have the maps on, on, on a flat surface and we were measuring the projection of the distance. We are not taking into account the third dimension. So for instance, when we, we think, we, we, you see in papers when the, the, there is the width function estimated, it's not the width function of the 3D surface, it's the three dimension is the, the width function of the projection this can bring in some biases, <laughs> but there is not one single paper in the world that deals with it because of the this teach you, this this uh, this class also teach you how the things goes because uh, we have some inheritance of the past. Uh, David Carbotton, Larry Band did, did this way, and now all the world <laughs> did does the aid like it and uh, in, not in, in another way at the same time we are using uh, the planar projection of the area the planar projection of the length in the estimating all the, our stuff and you can believe me that here for instance you have a, a steeper slopes so here the planar direct the, the, uh, the planar distance means a lot more of, of, of distance because you have a, a slope like 30 degrees or 40 degrees even. But that is another question. If we have uh, taken the, the, uh, the, the Euclidean distance for the outlet, for instance, which could be, could be a naive way to measure the distance to outlet, you, you would have a thing like this. You see the circles. The center is the outlet over there. So uh, a picture completely different from the previous one. So what we learn? Once we have the drainage, uh, uh, we are, once we have the, the, the gradients, we can uh, we can go uh, we can calculate the drainage direction where we we can. We have the drainage direction, we can have the areas on top of that. And when we have all of this, we can separate the catchments, uh, which is essentially what we need for, for these classes. Uh, there are some disclaimer. In doing all this stuff, we, we use some method. This method are historically signed by the way the people did, did the first of it. There are some error that we do when we choose the drainage directions. One error is due to the different orientation of the grids and the Lavia landscape, which is, in my view, the main error. And the other error is due to the, the fact that the curvature are there. And so you have a divergent and convergent surfaces. And convergent surfaces, you don't do, in any case, a lot of errors. But in divergent surfaces, you can uh, be quite wrong in accumulating the areas. That's all.